members, I want to just remind us all that we are on the traditional lands of the Duwamish people. Uh, but today we are going to be hearing from Zach Cooper and Hannah Dawson uh, presenting the description of their research rotations. So it looks like it's most of the people are familiar with this, but just in case you're somebody I don't know who doesn't know the, how this works in this program, is that in order to attain an astrobiology PhD, you must complete one quarter of uh, research outside of your home department and outside of your expertise, uh, and then come back and give the whole program uh, the rundown on what you did. And so that's what's going to happen today. So we're gonna hear first from Zach um, and then from Hannah. So uh, each one is gonna speak for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, then with time for five or 10 minutes for questions while we do the switch of laptops. And uh, I think that's about it. So, um, and I just want to also say both of them completed their rotations during the pandemic. So I think for that, we should just give them a round of applause right now. <laughs> Congratulations on finishing that. Um, and so with that, I will stop talking now and please can't pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for everybody that's uh, here today and that's online joining us. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the research I did for my astrobiology rotation on uh, cryobrine habitability and Raman detections of biological salt ice features. Um, whoop, doo -doo -doo, let's go. I always start off my talks with acknowledgments and the first thing I wanna do is just to, uh... oh boy, well, that's fun. I'm gonna figure out how to fix that real quick. Is that better? That's not better? Hold on. I can't because it's like, Two different screens that aren't connecting right. This is always very fun. Uh, got it. Okay. We will resume the show momentarily. More fun for everyone. If I don't have my displays swapped. Oh, that's the trick. We're getting there. I got to find Zoom again. There it is. Thank you for your patience. Is that better? Yep. Let me make this thing at the top go away potentially. Okay. Well, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Coast Salish and Duwamish, in honor with gratitude the land itself and the tribes on whose land we work and study. And I would also like to acknowledge that the field work that I conducted for this project was conducted on the traditional lands and waters of the Inupiat people with the assistance of the Ukiahavik and Ukiah Corporation, uh, which is a native owned uh, research uh, group. And I honor with gratitude the lands and seas themselves and the tribes on whose land we work and study. I also uh, did all this work in collaboration with multiple institutions, uh, labs here at the University of Washington and at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and with, uh, did my research with Scott Pearl at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so my funding sources for my project mainly have been from the Moore Foundation and uh, from NASA and the Virtual Planetary Laboratory. So just a little outline on what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I'm gonna to start with a, kind of an introduction to the environments that I study. So very specifically to talk about cryopegs and what they are and why they're good astrobiology analogs for other habitable environments in our solar systems. And then I'll uh, talk a little bit about this organism called Marinobacter, which is a bacterial genus that inhabits the cryopeg brines. And then I will uh, move on to talking about how I've uh, tried to explore biosignatures using Raman spectroscopy with uh, cultured bacteria. And then I'll kind of wrap up thinking about open questions that we have on detecting life in cryopic brines. I'm gonna um, remove my mask, I think, if that's safe and fine for the room. Uh, so you can all hear me better. I have, you know, wanna make that easy for everybody. So what are cryopegs, you might ask? That's a silly word that I just like put up here, but it's very cool. Cryopegs are subterranean unfrozen layers uh, within permafrost. I'm just gonna click on this so it'll go away. Okay. Um, and I have produced this uh, kind of schematic diagram to explain to you how they, they form. So if you can imagine a, uh, a setting within a coastal environment where there's permafrost next to a body of water, of seawater that forms uh, like we experience on earth during interglacial periods or you know, potentially like we could have experienced on Mars during some sort of uh, oceanic period. Um, and then you can imagine that that uh, 
seawater will evaporate at some point in time when sea levels fall, when ice forms and atmospheric temperatures fall away. And then our marine sediments that were previously saturated fully with seawater would begin to freeze as well. And they would be incorporated into our permafrost table, causing the cryoconcentration of the saline fluids that were left behind in the pore space of those sediments. And when that happens, we uh, force a eutectic point depression of those fluids, allowing them to remain liquid at temperatures much lower than zero degrees Celsius, even approaching minus 50 degrees Celsius. And in this case, we get these very salty brines that still produce a liquid space that we consider uh, traditionally habitable. And the idea that uh, bacteria inhabit most liquid environments that we have on Earth. Um, so that's kind of exciting. And then over time, we have the sedimentation of new permafrost and the burial of these systems that pretty much stabilizes them into place into this sort of geophysical regime where they are maintained on Earth for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years and have been recorded out to millions of years uh, in place as uh, unfrozen saline marine sediments. So that's very Cool. And for my dissertation, I've worked on uh, this particular cryopic system that we found here in Utkiakovic, Alaska. And here's um, just a closed in schematic of the region. We sampled all of our cryopics through this tunnel here that I'll explain more in a second. It's about one kilometer away from the modern shoreline. And so this is a, a geological schematic uh, cross view of the tunnel diagram itself. And uh, here's an image of me crawling down the access chamber to it. So it's kind of an intimidating place to get to in the tunnel itself, this ladder, the shaft you climb down is about, you know, five meters down to the bottom. And then it's uh, about a meter and a half tall working space. And just uh, for reference, I'm a, about a two meter tall person. So that produces its own sorts of challenges. Uh, and then we would drill another couple of meters down into the ground below the massive ice formation that encompasses this tunnel into the saline permafrost layer uh, beneath it. And so you can see these yellow crosshatched areas are where we were actually able to find brine. And so they are uh, very subterranean uh, systems that we accessed and we were able to sample these brines directly by uh, pumping them out of these boreholes that we drilled uh, using the most sterile techniques possible, uh, given the circumstances. You can see we're all hunched and close together and just kind of cozy in there. But this is very exciting. And we know that uh, we measured these brines to be between 115 and 140 parts per thousand or 11 to 14 percent salt, if that's more comfortable. Um, and that they exist stably, you know, throughout the year at the most between minus eight and minus six degrees. So this is a very tight sub-zero um, physical regime where they stay uh, held at these conditions. So it's very exciting. That's kind of unique among a lot of extreme environments on Earth that they're stably maintained at these extreme conditions. And this system uh, that we study has been in place for about 40,000 years based on our uh, organic carbon dating. And that means that these brines have been isolated external influences for about that long. I was involved in the end and I was like, oh, might as well just get yeah. off, do I? Um, so they already have the TA assignments assigned. Hey, Lisa, I can hear you uh, on Zoom. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to let you know we all can. <laughs> so what we found in the cryopix was very exciting, and this is in the first chapter of my dissertation work, that the bacterial communities that inhabit them are, are very dense with about 10 to the 8th bacterial cells per milliliter, which is, you know, 100 million bacteria in every milliliter, which is about as dense as we find them anywhere in the world. And that they're more mostly dominated by this one species of, or one genus of bacteria called Marinobacter. And uh, this is all in the context of very organic rich, very nitrogen rich uh, brine setting. And that's very cold and very dense. And so here's an, an image under a microscope at about 1,562.5 times magnification, <laughs> uh, where you can see bacterial cells very clearly. And this is from that very dense assemblage, just the natural community. And you can imagine that about half the cells you see on the page here are those marina bacteria themselves. So that's very cool. So what I really want to know is like, oh, wow, this is an amazing amount of life growing in these brines. They're growing very densely. And I want to know more about uh, why they're doing that and how we can observe life in these extreme settings that are very analogous to how we might find them on Mars. Okay, so in the laboratory, I isolated marina bacter, which is very exciting. And I did this via a serial dilution method where we uh, isolate from our brine down about, you know, as many times as we need to. And then I take a bacterium from the lowest culture where we still have growth. And in this scenario, we have about one cell per milliliter. And hopefully that's our most abundant bacterium. So I was able to isolate a novel species of marina bacter from the cryopeg brines, which is very exciting. 
Um, and we found that this species of marina vector can grow from temperatures as low as negative 10 degrees at least up to uh, about 20 degrees Celsius, not much more than that, and that it grows at salinities of 17 to 140 parts per thousand, which is really good to see that they grow at our in C2 conditions and that they can tolerate much higher salinities and still uh, be viable after that. And that they are uh, heterotrophic bacteria. So that means they consume organics and they respire CO2. So very exciting. Um, uh, part of my dissertation as well, I'm working on pangenomics. So just to put these new bacteria in the place of uh, the context of all other species of marina vector. And here's kind of a map of Earth with the global distribution of marina vectors so that we can see who we're comparing them to. And the most exciting thing that really jumps out is finding that, oh, our marina vectors from here in northern Alaska are most closely related to the only two other species of marina vector that were also isolated from sub-zero brines. And those are from sea ice brines here also in the Arctic, and then from a subglacial brine called Blood Falls in Antarctica. And so you see that there's a huge, uh, I didn't explain this chart very well because there's a lot going on, but it's a, a 53 ring Venn diagram where you can see which <laughs> genes occur in you know, each different genome in the pan genome. But essentially what it's telling us is that there's a huge amount of genetic diversity in this genus and that our group from sub-zero brines have some very specific adaptations and genes to allow them to live there. And they're all closely related around that. So that's exciting. So I wanted to take these bugs with me to uh, JPL so that we can actually use some of the types of instruments and measures that we can deploy on rovers and spacecrafts like Raman spectroscopy to see how we can use these to inform our search for biosignatures on Mars or on other icy moons. And so we have these guiding questions. Can you detect distinct biosignatures using Raman spectroscopy in the remnants of a desiccated brine? So something we might find on the surface of Mars. Um, or are there obvious uh, visual differences in biological versus abiotic desiccated brines? And these are, you know, open questions. There's a lot to think about here. And this is just a, an artistic image of, you know, if Mars were covered in an ocean and then desiccated in the future. So what I did was uh, here at UW in Seattle, I ran this experiment to test the growth range of marina bacter. And we grew marina bacter in a set of nine different media ranging from 17 to 200 parts per thousand. And then I took these samples uh, with me to JPL and we put droplets onto these microscope slides and let them air dry at room temperature. And this happens very fast in like five to 10 minutes. And then we were able to um, use a Raman spectroscopy coupled with a very large uh, electronic microscope to look at these different salt features and to take some measurements to see what's going on. And here you can kind of see from these slides uh, that as the salinity increases going down the columns, we start to form these larger and larger visibly distinct uh, salt crystals. And that kind of informs our ability to understand what's going on. So now I have a few videos to share with you. And this first one is actually watching the leading edge of a halite crystal here growing. And you, uh, noting the scale bar at about 20 micrometers, can see bacteria that are kind of flowing around the edge of it. Is it playing well up here? Oh, kind of, yeah. And so you can see um, the bacteria being kind of drawn around the crystal and, and to a degree incorporated into the structure. And that's not very clear with this video, which is very slow. So I'm gonna to skip to the next one because I don't wanna take up way too much time. But this crystal grows very quickly. This is a different branching morphology of a halite type crystal. This is in real time. Um, and here you can see smaller bacterial cells. So here, here, and here. And you can watch as they're actually incorporated very directly into the crystal itself. And so. This is a, our first sign that the salt crystals, instead of getting rid of any sort of biology, are actually holding on to them and incorporating that. So that's, that's kind of good news for me, good news for all of us, and it's just very beautiful uh, to watch happen. But now what, what we're left with are these remnants, <laughs> these actual desiccated crystal brines, and we have to search those uh, to see if there's biology in them. Um, I have one more video here. Oh, that's the same video. Cool. So. Um, Here's what we found. This is an image here, now zoomed in a little bit uh, with a scale bar of about two micrometers. And this is a very nice little uh, rectangular um, prism of a halite crystal. And you can actually see this feature right here on the face of it is actually a bacterial cell that's been kind of caught on the face of this crystal as it grew upward, separated from water and maintained in place. And here's a little pocket of brine inside of that crystal that includes you know, the other sorts of things that might have been living <laughs> in, the, in the fluid when it was formed. So that's exciting. So what we've done is uh, use that Raman laser to shoot uh, a laser at our crystal and to measure what sort of uh, molecules are vibrating at the base of uh, the laser. And we can use the 
uh, intensity of that over this spectrum of uh, Raman shift measurements to get an idea of what sorts of uh, organic molecules are present in our system. And so we end up with a spectrum like this. And this one's pretty dramatic looking, but we'll talk about that more in just a second. I have another kind of feature here that you can see with a warning, you know, because it is a laser. So you can actually see something that looks very nice and biological and then shoot the laser at it and burn it. So you can't see it super well, but there's a hole in our sample now. So the laser, oh, this technique comes with, you know, some difficulties. And what we found is, oh, this, big peak here that I was very excited about finding first is actually just uh, burnt carbon. So that's uh, <laughs> how you identify uh, like glass, like elemental carbon. <laughs> so um, pretty cool, but there's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done with that. But you know, to answer that other question, this is from a much more densely grown sample where we are looking at the interior space of a halite crystal. And this should actually be more like that rectangular polygonal shape. But what we see, and I'm sorry, it's a little bright in here. Could we Turn down the lights a little bit. Uh, if that's possible because this is a really, I think, stunning image. Uh, yeah, each one of these is a bacterium uh, caught inside of the pore space in this crystal and preventing it from forming its proper shape. So what we found is this huge, massive, like desiccation graveyard of bacteria caught in our crystals, and this is a very clear signal. You do not see things like this in completely abiotic brine. So this was very exciting. That oh, we can definitely observe microbial morphologies from densely populated brines when they're desiccated into crystals. Um, you know, and that's that's great. So thank you for the lights. I think that that's the, you know, one I needed for now. Yeah, and we can take a spectra of that too. But what we want to do is know more about what's what's in these uh, in this spectrum that I'm looking at. And that's that turns out to be a pretty difficult question to ask, especially because I grew the bacteria in a media with organics. And so inherently we're measuring the organics from the media and from our bacteria, but we want to difference out our actual biosignature from our background signature of our media. And so what we can do is put our blank spectrum up next to our actual biological one and try to find out where there are peaks in our real uh, biological spectrum that vary from our um, blank. And that can be pretty difficult because as you can see, we have a, a spread and a spectrum of blank spectra that we can possibly have. And the same is true. Every small micro scale feature of a sample can have a very different uh, organic spectrum. So there's a lot to learn here, but we can identify these peaks on the green line. So I'll just go back for a second. You can see these very nice tiny little peaks here are some of the unique signals that we can find that don't occur in any of our blanks, but do occur in our biological sample. So I don't know what we're actually looking at very directly with these signals. And that's uh, an important part. These are preliminary results. This was a short rotation, but uh, we can see that there is a signal. So that's a biosignature check number one. And I'm excited <laughs> about that. So <laughs> um, this was very cool. And so what I'm prepared to tell you now is that we can use Raman to try to, fi to find true biological signals separated away from abiotic signals in desiccated brines. And so that's, it's pretty cool step one. And then our next step that we wanted to do was to see um, how we can use this to observe colder brines and colder and icier systems. And so what I have here is another very long video that I'll get going. But what you can see each one of these lighter dots is, um, is a bacterium. Could we uh, turn the lights down a little bit again? Thank you very much. Um, and, and we're looking at this uh, while this fluid is actually at negative 15 degrees Celsius. And over the you know, kind of the top of the screen, like towards you out of the panel, there's ice growing over the top of this fluid space. And I'm going to skip for a little while because this is a, a long process, but we actually were able to capture um, the ice forming in the plane that we're observing bacteria flow. And so here you see the ice crystal coming from the top and moving down around and actually forcing and pushing our bacteria into the brine pockets that form inside of saline ice. And so I'll, I'll just skip again for a few more seconds because there's one really cool feature that forms and I don't want to keep us all here forever. So if you watch this area right here on the screen, uh, we'll actually form a, a nice brine pocket. It's going to um, kind of pull down around this and you'll see that it does entrain and actually trap. Oh, there it is. Yeah, bacteria inside of it. And so you can see this guy right here just swimming, wiggling around, swimming in our brine ice pocket that we formed at negative 15 degrees Celsius. It's very salty here. And uh, yeah, that's all. So I have, you know, a, a follow-up video to this. We wanted to focus more on this. So this is one individual 
brine pour at negative 15 degrees C. And you can see individual cells here and note the scale, this is zero to five micrometers at the bottom, very small, but we can see bacteria wiggling and swimming inside of this isolated brine core at negative 15 degrees Celsius. So if we're looking for life, we can hope and expect to find motility in very cold brines. And if it's there, we can observe it, uh, which is very exciting potentially. And uh, in the future, you know, we want to help uh, move into applying this using Raman spectroscopy, but I ran out of time during my rotation. So we weren't able to go much farther than that, but um, thank you for sharing in that experience with me. So I'll just wrap up uh, a little bit with some preliminary takeaways from this project and uh, things that we did find out. And that's that uh, microbiology does have microscopically observable effects on salt crystal morphology um, that we can use Raman spectroscopy uh, to characterize organics and salt crystals for identifying biosignatures and that uh, we can observe uh, microbial motility in sub-zero brine settings. And so this is very exciting, at least in the lab we can do that and hopefully we can do it in the field, but it does leave us with some open questions that are very important for our uh, search for life on Mars and around icy moons. And so that's asking, you know, what molecules are we actually detecting that differ from the background? And can we actually see those same uh, signatures if we are looking at a brine sample, a frozen brine sample? And um, how can we do this if we're agnostic to what the expected chemistry of the system is. A lot of Raman spectroscopy now is very dependent on you having standards and knowing what you're trying to find in your sample to identify um, the output. And then uh, we want to know how we can use this data to help plan and inform missions on Mars on uh, rovers and probes and so that we can actually deploy it in an applicable way. And so that's uh, where I'll end my talk. I'll leave these questions up here and take any questions uh, that you all have. Thank you very much, Zach. So yeah, we do have time for a few questions. Zach, there was a feature at like 29. Sure. I think that the- This big? Yeah, thing? no, 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 no. In the green one. Mm -hmm. Right here? There's like a big spiky. Oh, right here? Yeah. Oh, I see, yeah. Is that also a likely? You know, I, I want it to be, and I, I hope it was. <laughs> Uh, I saw that one, but you see there's this like peak right here in the blank. And so I think it's just some like amplification of a material in the media that the bacteria are taking advantage of. There is a lot of thought to be done about thinking about the intensity of these different uh, peaks and how that might inform us. But right now our methods are pretty much uh, telling us to look at individual peaks. And if we find that peak in our blank, then we can't really run with it as a unique signal. So I see I have a question online from, from Marshall, raising your hand. If you want to go ahead and ask the question. Yeah. Uh, hey, Zach. So uh, my question was, when you were showing the videos of the, the ice freezing and the bacteria swimming around, how did you obtain those videos? Is it just liquid squished between slides and then um, you refrigerated or something? That's a good question. So actually, in the lab I was working on, there's this very large uh, microscope instrument that has a Raman spectroscopy, uh, Raman laser built into it, as well as an atomic force microscope. And we were actually using a liquid nitrogen fueled cryo stage in there. And so we were actually actively cooling the brine in the stage where we have a slide with a cover slip on top of it that our media with our cells is in. And so we were freezing that in real time uh, for the measurements and for the analysis. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool, sophisticated setup, but there's a lot of challenges involved with you know, actively cooling while you're making ramen <laughs> measurements and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Certainly give you some good videos. But yeah, definitely some very good videos. It's very exciting. Re questions from the room? I have a question back here. So uh, first. I was going to ask, has this been applied to look at like fossil bacteria in the river? Yeah, it, it sure has. So the um, PI that I was working with, Scott Pearl, his main focus is understanding um, you know, biosignatures of life in very salty environments. And so he's done a lot of work on salt crystals from the Great Salt Lake and from deep salt mines where you can find actually these fluids that are trapped inside of halite crystals can be hundreds of millions of years old. So he has some 50 to 500 million year old salt crystals with fluids in them that he has been able to find actual like to take DNA out of and find actual cells still present in those samples. So this technology is directly being applied on Earth with the hope that you can like apply that same sort of logic in space. Mm -hmm. Zach? Um, a lot of really cool stuff. Cool. And 
my, my question asks about do you think drying and like having a bacteria like encased in that salt crystal um, would actually extend like how long that biofilms are like detectable compared to like getting dried in a less salty? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think I, I should have mentioned. Can you repeat the question for oh, people online? I sorry, I say that every every week. So yeah, I will. I will repeat. The, <laughs> sorry for if you didn't hear. His question was: uh, Does the actual presence of salt help improve the preservation of biosignatures over a long period of time? And I think the answer is yes. So I think the the saltier it is, the less you know potentially biologically active it is around the sample. So you're less worried about degradation by other microbes, and you do have a stabilization factor for a lot of uh, biomolecules like DNA and RNA. So these uh, ion ionic molecules are more stable in a very salty setting. So I think my answer is yes, initially, and especially in the case where you form salt crystals that have completely enclosed inclusions, that's uh, much better for biosignature preservation because then you can't even have atmospheric decay or like escape of that carbon at all. You know, if these are like, if we're looking at the face of a salt crystal or a salt patty plane, but they're still like, uh, you know, exposed organics on the top, even if they've been desiccated, those could be consumed or taken away or burnt off or something, right? So yeah, I think it does help, but there's a lot to, of factors to consider, yeah. One more question? All right, then why don't we okay. thank Zach again, and then we'll do a couple of, a minute to change over to Hannah. Sounds great, thank you everybody. <laughs> What can you all see in Zoom? <laughs> we see your presentation looks ready to go. Uh, okay. Or what we can't see the camera or anything. Can you guys see the full thing or can you see your presentation slides? Just the presentation mode. So, like, we just see the title slide only. Perfect. And you can hear me? Yeah, and we can see you now, too. Oh. I think the owl turned off. There was like a red flash at the bottom. I think that's it was on. I think it's on now. They said they could see it, right? Well, but not oh, the video. Sure. And there aren't any. The, the eyes aren't there. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to switch your video, I believe. Okay. The top, switch your video. There you go. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for checking out all the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all we right. got the cre creepy whole room view now. Looks good. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm going to take my mask off. All right. Well, thank you all for being here, both in person and on Zoom. And today I'm going to be talking to you about my astrobiology rotation, looking at uh, expanding the known marine virome using viromics and getting at the first measures of RNA viruses in sea ice. So I also would like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, you can't have too many land acknowledgements and <laughs> acknowledge that at uh, the UW School of Oceanography, we work on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Coast Salish people and the Duwamish people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the tribes on whose traditional lands we work and study. 
And I'll also start with some other acknowledgements for everyone who made this rotation work possible, um, especially during the pandemic, including everyone at Rutgers, um, my collaborators in the Tamatra Colon and Vital Lab, everyone in the AB program, um, folks in the uh, Young and Deming labs in oceanography that helped with collecting these samples, and the captain and the crew of the RV Nathaniel B. Palmer, as well as my funding sources, including um, a, an award from the College of the Environment for this sequencing that I'm gonna talk about today. So just to give a very brief context for where this fits into my dissertation, um, looking at viruses is definitely not something I normally do, but after I thought about it, it really makes sense with everything else I'm working on. So I normally am looking at abundant metabolites or the small molecule organics that are the products of metabolism inside cells, uh, particularly in sea ice microorganisms and uh, particularly with eukaryotic algae. And I'm interested in how um, these organics change with environmental variables like temperature and salinity um, and how that might impact their surrounding environment and uh, larger biogeochemical cycling in uh, polar oceans. Um, and one thing I've not really looked at in this environment is viruses, which do also have a potential to alter cellular contents of these organisms, as well as the release of those organics into the environment. So my overall goals for my rotation were to perform the first measurements of RNA viruses in sea ice using an RNA metagenomic analysis of extracellular RNA virions in order to get the kind of first pass study of their prevalence, diversity, and potential hosts in the environment. And in doing so, gain skills in RNA extraction and sequencing along with uh, metagenome analysis, which is not something I do in my normal line of work looking at metabolites. Um, so I just want to start with a pitch that viruses are understudied overall and in astrobiology as well, um, with the current NASA astrobiology strategy having only six mentions of viruses in 216 pages. And I like this kind of <laughs> snarky quote from Berliner et al. 2018, that perhaps the astrobiology community is not yet fully aware of the amazing ubiquity, diversity, and roles of viruses in biogeochemistry, evolution, and the origins of life. So I highly recommend this read if you want to learn more about astrobiology. And some of the broad goals um, are to expand uh, knowledge about the diversity of life on Earth, further methods for detecting and understanding non-Terran life, characterizing viruses that inhabit extreme environments on Earth that can be analogs for celestial bodies, but also for the early Earth, and understand the roles of viruses in the current Earth biosphere to gauge their potential importance in other biospheres. And one of the reasons for interest in viruses is just their sheer abundance, which I have here that they're astronomically abundant, particularly in terrestrial oceans. So viruses are the most abundant biological entities on Earth and numerically um, uh, are 10 times more abundant than any cellular life on Earth. Um, and this is particularly true in our oceans where in one milliliter of seawater, there are generally from one to 10 million viral particles. And there's an estimated, a very conservative estimated total abundance of greater than 10 to the 30 virions in the sea. And viruses have been found everywhere that life has been found on Earth. And it's assumed that all cellular life is expected to have associated viruses. So if we back up and think about what a virus is, um, it's contentious how to define viruses, but I'm gonna use this kind of inclusive definition that viruses are entities whose genomes are element of elements of nucleic acid acid that replicate inside living cells using the cellular synthetic machinery and causing the synthesis of specialized elements that can transfer the viral genome to other cells. So just the reminder of the basic viral cycle that virions uh, attach to a host cell and the viral genome enters the host cell, uh, then reprogramming the cellular machinery to produce more virions, which are eventually released from the cell and can infect other host cells. And I think it's interesting to think of viruses as more of this whole process rather than any individual particle where the virions that are found outside of the cells are akin to seeds that can only uh, replicate in an appropriate environment, which in this case is inside of a living host cell. And another interesting question in terms of viruses and astrobiology is, are they alive? Which is an even more contentious question. Um, and maybe more uh, easy, an easier question to answer is, are they part of life? Um, so I think this is super interesting following Dr. Sarah Walker's talk last week, thinking about 
life as uh, the flow of information, which viruses would definitely qualify. And thinking about her analogy of a cup, which is not, we wouldn't think it's living, but it's definitely a part of human life and a product of life. Um, so viruses fit NASA's working definition of life pretty well, um, which is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, except for the self-sustaining part, um, since they do rely on host cell machinery for replication. But I like these quotes that if a virion were to be unequivocally detected in an extraterrestrial sample, very few people would claim that this would not be evidence for life. And what is unambiguous is that viruses are fund a fundamental uh, part of the living world. And that's definitely true. We've already seen that um, with their selective mortality on host cells acting as an important selective pre pressure driving um, evolution in host populations. Um, their extensive, extensive uh, horizontal gene transfer, which can introduce novel uh, genes into host populations, and their alteration of metabolisms of host cells through um, auxiliary me metabolic genes. And also they have a huge impact on our spiogenic chemical cycles through the lysis of host cells and release of organic matter. But there are a number of knowledge gaps in the biosphere still. And a lot of these knowledge gaps are um, addressed in this really nice white paper for the Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey from Trouble et al. 2020. And I encourage you to read it for more. Um, but since I don't have time to talk about all of this, I'm mainly interested in the diversity of viruses or filling the gap of the diversity of viruses and their evolutionary relationships, their influence on Earth's biogeochemical cycles and climate, and viruses as drivers of evolution, distribution, and persistence of life. So one of the really interesting parts about viruses is their really wide diversity in viral systems of information flow. Um, so here I'm showing you just a classic Baltimore classification scheme of different viral types based on their genetic material and route for producing RNA. And viruses are unique in the current biosphere since they have genetic material that can be made from either DNA or RNA and be single-stranded or double-stranded, whereas cellular life is based on double-stranded DNA and genomic DNA. So some viruses only use RNA for their um, entire replication cycle, which has led some re researchers to postulate that they may be relics or direct descendants from the RNA world and have been um, important in that tra transition from the RNA to DNA world. So I'm particularly interested in those um, RNA viral genomes since better understanding these unique replicators that use different types of nucleic acid could expand how we think about non-classical uh, forms of life we might find elsewhere. And unfortunately, <laughs> single-stranded RNA viruses are at the height of everyone's attention recently with the SARS-CoV-2 virus being a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about how our knowledge of viruses, particularly in the marine environment, can inform our understanding of both viruses for astrobiological purpose, but also for um, human health purposes. So there's this really nice article in Scientific American um, by um, the Ocean Memory Group, including Jody Deming here at UW, um, thinking about how the evolutionary history of single-stranded RNA viruses that began in the oceans can inform our understanding of COVID. But um, environmental research has largely focused on viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes. Um, and this is partially due to methodological biases or limits in that a lot of our methods for enumerating viruses or detecting them based on DNA stains or fluorescent dyes are geared towards uh, detecting DNA. And even if you had the right stains, um, viral genomes made of RNA are often very small and it really at the limit of detection using those methods. Um, and also most metagenomic analyses are directly targeting the, of seawater are directly targeting the double-stranded DNA containing virions. And from all evidence thus far, um, these viruses are very abundant, very diverse, and largely infect bacterial cells. But this begs the question, are we missing half of the viruses in the ocean um, based on all of these potential biases I was talking about? So recently, a number of studies have begun to try to address the question of how many RNA viruses are in the sea and more detailed questions about their diversity, relatedness, and role in the environment. Um, so here, um, I just have two recent examples trying to get at that enumeration problem. 
um, which both are looking at coastal seawater, one in Hawaii and one in the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which both have shown that RNA viral abundance in seawater may rival that of DNA viruses, at least at times. So if you look at these tables, you can see that the percentage of RNA viruses compared to DNA viruses ranges from close to or more than the DNA viruses. And we're not sure how across the board of a rule this is, since these are two studies and we don't have a ton of this kind of work done yet, but it suggests that at least at times, if we're only looking at the DNA viral community, we could be missing a large fraction of the viruses in the environment and their potential impacts on host populations. So an important advance at getting at um, uh, RNA viruses has been metagenomics or RNA viromics, if you want to call it that, um, which is theoretically comprehensively sampling all of the genes and all of the organisms present in a complex sample and um, applying these now to the RNA world when it was most commonly used for looking at prokaryotic uh, communities. And in the past decade, metagenomics has really exponentially increased the known RNA uh, virus world in the ocean, uh, partially because uh, in contrast to cultivation-based methods um, or marker gene approaches, the metagenomic analysis can give a more global assessment of community sequence diversity and insight into ecological roles and evolutionary relationships through those sequences. And um, viromics has just recently begun to be applied to look at viral roles in polar environments. So within the brine channels of sea ice, which I'm showing you a schematic of over here, um, viruses that infect bacteria are abundant and can reach densities higher than their hosts but um, not much has been done looking at their phylogenetic diversity or uh, ecological roles before. And just recently this paper came out in 2020 with some familiar names from the Deming lab in the author list looking at just that. So looking at DNA-based viruses using metagenomics, um, which is I think super interesting, especially for an environment um, that we're, often interested in for astrobiological purposes as an analog for icy celestial bodies. Um, it's an extreme environment and dynamic with large changes in temperature, salinity, uh, nutrients, and light throughout the year. But we don't still have a very good picture of what's going on inside these environments, in particular in terms of viruses. And another recent study that I'll be talking a little bit about more later uh, is one of the first looks at um, RNA viruses in polar waters uh, and seawater in the Antarctic, but RNA viruses not, have not been measured or characterized within sea ice. So again, the goals for my rotation were to get at that kind of first pass analysis of RNA, if RNA viruses, we can detect them in sea ice at all, and then hopefully getting some more detailed uh, information about their diversity and potential hosts and also to gain skills in extraction, RNA extractions and sequencing and metagenomics, which I'll also note is a big <laughs> uh, project to chew off just for a, a astrobiology rotation. So I'm still working on a lot of this uh, data processing and incorporating this into my dissertation research. Um, so to do this, I worked with collaborators at the Rutgers Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences, uh, namely Dr. Kim Tamatrakon and Dr. Hannah Kronzler. And here's just like an overall view of how this project um, should go. And if I'll show you the little timeline on the bottom, it was in very much in fits and starts, especially, but I'm glad that anything is happening on this project this year. Um, so it started with sample collection in the field in Antarctica, and I'll talk a little bit about that in 2019. Um, my in-person rotation was at Rutgers uh, during the winter quarter of this year, learning how to do RNA extractions and sending them off for sequencing. And then a bioinformatician, Udi Zelzian, has been really helping out with some of the heavy lifting since I'm not a bioinformatician on quality control and getting that metagenome analysis started. And I'm just now starting to think about questions I wanna ask and analyses to do to get at those questions. So to do this, we went to Antarctica. We were going for, to Antarctica for other reasons, but opportunistic sampling arose. Um, so we collected, um, sea ice aboard the RV Nathaniel B. Palmer in 2019. And um, we were able to sample, since we were on an icebreaker up and down the peninsula, including both Northern stations and Southern stations, 
in total seven different locations, we were able to collect sea ice. Um, and here's, <laughs> I just love this little cartoon I took, especially if you look on the bottom, you can see uh, Shelly Carpenter and Zach Cooper <laughs> sightseeing as we're weaving our way through the ice and going to different ice stations. And we were also able to collect uh, varied ice types and uh, ice at different environmental conditions while we were sampling, including intact land fast ice that we could actually just walk out on to sample, large ice flows that we had to be lifted over the side of the boat to go out and sample, deteriorating ice flows that we took Zodiac boats out to, and uh, really deteriorated brash ice, slushy ice. And one of the unifying features of the ice we sampled was a dominance of diatoms in bottom sea ice, which is mainly what we were collecting. So you can see in this video that Susan took of uh, GoPro footage underneath one of the ice flows we sampled, all of this kind of green coloration in the bottom of the ice, um, that's mainly made up of diatoms. And you can see maybe little krill swimming around and eating those diatoms. And on the right, I have some um, microscopy images I took aboard um, the boat um, where you can see a really diverse assemblage of diatoms dominating this community. And to get at the uh, viral particles, um, we melted our sea ice and then pre-filtered our melted sea ice through a 0 .0, uh, 0.2 micron filter uh, to get rid of cellular matter. And then once we had that cell-free filtrate, we then filtered it onto a 0 0.02 micron filter, which should catch those viral particles. Um, and that's definitely easier said than done, pushing water through a 0 0.02 micron filter. Um, so we use these uh, Anatop syringe filters and our collaborators at Rutgers came, Rutgers came up with a unique method uh, to be able to push water through these syringes using a pop gun that we modified slightly using the machine shop over in oceanography. And then once we have those viral particles caught on that filter, we can freeze this filter and take it back home for later analysis. So that's where uh, my time at Rutgers started with my little corner in the uh, Bidal entomological lab that I was super happy to be able to have and finally have my hands back on things in the lab. Um, and uh, here I learned how to do RNA extractions, basically taking that intact viral genomes that are inside uh, viral capsids and getting at it into a um, isolated purified RNA form using a commercial um, RNA extraction kit. But commercial RNA extraction kit doesn't really do it justice um, because this method was definitely uh, modified uh, for this type of sampling for RNA viral particles uh, by Kim and Hana, um, which included, <laughs> they looked super silly, but it worked, um, that these anatop filters, we can't take the filters out. Um, so you have to do your lysis or busting up of those viral capsids inside this filter with flanking syringes and a rotating rotisserie oven to make sure we get full coverage. <laughs> which this was definitely my favorite part of the day. I feel like it looked like a carnival or something. <laughs> And I think I've been told that I'm now one of the three or four people in the world who know how to do this specific type of RNA extraction. So I can put that feather in my hat. <laughs> um, and once we have that extracted RNA, um, we can quantify it and check its purity before we send it off for sequencing to make sure we'll actually be able to get something meaningful back. And we did this using a nanodrop spectrophotometer, which works on the principle that nucleic acids absorb uh, light at a very at a specific wavelength. Um, so we can use the absorbance of that wavelength to calculate out the concentration of RNA that was within our samples. And this is an actual picture from my data of what it looks like coming off the computer and that little bump is where nucleic acid shows up. So this was super exciting to see in all of my samples because if, if you're familiar with molecular biology and just working with a lot of colorless fluids in a bunch of tubes all day, it's really nice to finally see some indication that you didn't lose everything along the way and there is something inside that tube. So then once I extracted RNA from all of those filters, which you can see me very proud with my graveyard of Anatop filters over on the left, um, we sent them off for sequencing, which we used a commercial company called GeneWiz to do this. And we were able to do the sequencing with funding from the College of the Environment through the Hall Conservation Genetics Award. 
And this is what you get back, <laughs> which is just as daunting as it looks. Um, so this is an example of raw sequence re results we get back. So basically you get back fragments of all those viral genomes that you hopefully uh, put into the sequencing machine. And I'm not an expert on how to make sense of this data. Um, so I've been working closely with a bioinformatician who is um, to work on post sequencing uh, data processing and analysis. And Udi has been helping me um, go through this process of taking our raw sequencing results, quality controlling them, and then starting to put them through pipelines to get at who is there. So questions of taxonomy and phylogeny of who, what viruses are inside our samples and what they're doing. And I'm not gonna go into super huge detail. I'll show some examples later of the kind of analyses that we're hoping to do with our data. And for some extremely preliminary but exciting results, we have viral hits. So um, Udi uh, compared, basically compared the nucleotide sequences or um, in our samples to that in reference databases of known viral sequences. And in all of our samples, we did have viral hits. So we have suggests the presence that we have RNA viruses in all of our samples. But obviously there's a lot more work to be done, but that's encouraging for me <laughs> to continue the good fight on this data. Um, so I've been uh, considering now what hypotheses I wanna address to get at more detailed questions. And these include, um, I'm gonna talk about the hypotheses and why I have those and how we might address those. So the first is that a high proportion of the identified viral populations or species will be novel. The second is that viral community composition will vary with sample type, in our case, between seawater and sea ice and between different ice types with different environmental conditions. And the third is that viruses will cl be closely related to those that infect hosts that dominate the ecosystem, which in our case, we're expecting a uh, relation to diatom infecting viruses, which are mostly positive uh, sensed single strand RNA viruses. Since we saw earlier that really diatom dominance in our samples. And uh, one of the ways we can get at that high proportion of um, novelty in our sequences is, um, or why I think we might see that, is based on that uh, first kind of DNA-based viral metagenomes that were just recently performed on Arctic sea ice, which is what I'm showing you over here on the left, um, where of the sequences that could be um, assigned viral origin, a very high proportion of them were novel. So out of 476 uh, viral populations, only 12% of them could be assigned taxonomy um, using traditional database approaches. So that's one way that we can look at that. Um, another is an example from that RNA virome I was mentioning from the Western Antarctic Peninsula, where they reconstructed near full genomes from five um, novel uh, viruses with three of them resembling diatom infecting viruses. And secondly, um, I think that the viral community composition will vary by sample. And this is again from that Arctic paper looking at DNA viruses, which we don't have a lot to go on since we, we've not, no one's looked at RNA viruses in sea ice. So we're basing some of this off of the uh, work of Zhang and others um, where they saw differences in that community composition between sample types both between cryopeg brines, which Zach mentioned earlier, and sea ice, but also within sea ice in different sections of the sea ice. And lastly, um, we think that the viruses will be related um, to those that infect hosts that dominate the ecosystem. And again, an example from that Arctic DNA uh, viromics paper, um, which for DNA viruses, there's a lot more scaffolds and pipelines to be able to analyze this kind of data and look for virus host relationships. So that's what this paper did in looking at sequence similarity between viral sequences and hosts present. And basically what they saw is that of the identifiable uh, viral sequences, a lot of them matched back to potential hosts that were those that dominated that system in this terms, in this case, in terms of prokaryotic composition. Um, but since we don't have those tools for RNA viruses, another way that we can get at these virus host relationships are looking at phylogeny based on marker genes. So similar to how you would use an 18S or 16S rRNA uh, gene as a marker for phylogeny and prokaryotic or eukaryotic life, um, for viruses, at least for the RNA viruses, you can use the RNA-directed uh, uh, RNA polymerase to do a similar kind of study where uh, viral sequences usually will 
based on that gene will group based on um, similar hosts that they infect. So this study, again, in um, the Western Antarctic Peninsula found that the majority of their sequences, which I don't know if my mouse is up there or not, but up here at the top, the majority of their sequences um, were similar to those of viruses that are single-stranded RNA and infect diatoms, which were also during, dominant during this sampling period in seawater off of Antarctica. So even though we're expecting uh, diatom infecting viruses to dominate, uh, we're not limiting our comparisons to reference databases to only those types of viruses. So we're keeping it wide open for all known RNA viral sequences to see what we find in sea ice. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that viruses are ubiquitous, abundant, and diverse biological entities inexorably tied to life on Earth, making them important to consider in the study of astrobiology and that RNA metagenomics is an expanding method that can shed light on the ecology and diversity of RNA viruses in sea ice. And that very, very preliminarily, we potentially detected RNA viruses inside sea ice with the goal of creating a more comprehensive view of the genetic landscape of the biosphere in an extreme environment on earth. And I'll be continuing to unravel that picture as I go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. So we have time for one or two questions. Sure, Taylor. Yeah, this is very technical, but when you were assessing your uh, your RNA, is there a reason why you use an anode drop and not like a spirometer, like a single spirometer or the ring? No, we did. We actually had the option to use both, but we were getting pretty similar concentrations between both of them, and the nano drop was easier to use, so we went with the nano drop. Yes, yeah, Susan. Fantastic talk. Thank Thanks so much. Um, so, at the beginning of the talk, we talked a little bit about how this could potentially tie into your work with metabolomics. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, is it just do you expect if you find more viruses that maybe you'll find more dissolved metabolites? Or, like, what, what is it that you expect? Yeah, that's definitely something I'm interested in trying to tie together, which I didn't mention, I have for all of the samples, we have uh, viromics for, we also have metabolomics data to look at those small molecule metabolites and amplicon data to be able to look at what potential hosts are abundant. So that's definitely something I'm interested in. Um, and I would wager a guess, you know, that like some of our metabolites, we would see a higher release into the dissolved phase, which hopefully with these samples, we'll be able to measure metabolites in both the particulate and dissolved phase and see that kind of lysis induced release in, um, into the uh, dissolved phase. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we can act how much we can say more than a correlation for that, since we won't really be having much detail on why that's happening. Um, and especially between different sample types, you know, we're having a lot of things change like temperature and salinity, which could change the dissolved organic matter content in our samples as well. So there might be a lot of confounding features in directly tying anything back to viral lysis, but it would be super interesting if we could. Mm -hmm. One more, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you decide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, my question is very quite basic, but uh, I'm just curious how you can identify normal virus and your know, data. So not by normal, I mean like some virus that has not been sequenced. Right, right. So there's definitely like it, if, to be able to say it's a viral sequence, um, we usually rely on it having some similarity to something in a database to be able to say that, hey, I think this is a virus. But that's definitely a good question since um, a lot of viruses and a lot of like that work on directly saying this is a viral sequence, sequence is based on like culture work and isolated viruses, um, which not a lot of work has been done on that, particularly for RNA viruses. Um, so right now it, it is definitely difficult to have a completely unknown sequence and say that it's a virus if it's not related to something we know. Um, but hopefully that will continue to get better as we have more of those kind of detailed lab characterization experiments. Thank you. All right, do you want to take that question? Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you were number two. <laughs> um, well, I, guess, I guess my big question here is, and I was motivated by a technical question, 
Uh, is there like free floating RNAs that are not viruses or in cells? And is that why you did that second small filtration step? Yeah. yeah, definitely. This is something we were just talking about the other day. Yeah, because there definitely could be from lysed cells, for example, you know, they could have mRNA that was released out into the environment. So if we were looking at that whole um, kind of viral fraction of the seawater without doing an additional mm -hmm. filtration step, that would definitely be um, more of a problem. We're um, expecting that not much, maybe some could have absorbed to the filter itself, but that mainly at that size fraction, we would be looking at um, virions. Thank you. Great, all right, well, before we wrap it up, I just wanna remind you all that next week we will be back in here again. So we have an in-person talk from Dr. Johnny Seals, um, but and now let's uh, thank Hannah and Zach for great talks today. Yeah. Great job. Yeah, thank you, Rory. Yeah.